Hi, Matthew. Hello, Karen. It is just so good to see you again. And you for those too. who don't know Matthew, this is Matthew Allison. And I call you Matt. I guess that's okay, right? Yes, that's fine. Okay. And, uh, and I'm Karen. People have been asking lately, who are you people? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I'll put more information in the show notes because we both have websites and YouTube channels and all that good stuff. So. Um, today we're here talking again about this book of Iris Murdoch's called The Sovereignty of Good. And we have progressed as far as the second chapter. And um, it's really a remarkable chapter full of all sorts of interesting ideas. And I was going to kind of give you a little bit of a framework that I was thinking of working from because some ideas sort of popped out to me from what she was talking about and it sort of there's a trajectory there for me so um because chapter two is is god and good kind of looking at this idea of what is the meaning of good and um how might that relate or not relate to a person's conception of god and some words stood out to me Okay, attention, simplicity, complexity, realism, love, self, knowledge, and choices. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the idea of attention and then move towards love, but um, before we start, and while I'm still thinking about it, I thought it might be interesting to play this very short clip of Jordan Peterson talking about love, because he very seldom talks about love. Okay? Do it. I'll bring it up here. Movement among humanity to bring being itself to a halt, you know, it culminated in the development of the hydrogen bomb. Um, and the high probability for many, at many periods of time that we were going to do something. It seems like a bad idea. It seems like a bad idea. Well, so what's the opposite of the Mephistophelian attitude? And I think the opposite of that is what's presented in the biblical stories in the guise of love. And that is the wish that things would be good. It's something like that. That's what love is, I think, is that it's the attempt to orient yourself towards making things better. And it, it's predicated on something like a, a deep appreciation for being, def, despite its suffering and deficiencies, and, and maybe a decision that you're going to act to bring about things, move things towards the good. And I think that's the thing that sets the parameters of the, of the aim. It's, it's the opposite of the Mephistophelian attitude. It's like, work towards the betterment of being because you've decided that you're going to open your heart to existence something like that and it's within that framework that truth takes place i think because truth has to serve something it can true can serve truth but it has to be bounded inside something and i think that that's what it's bounded inside so. so you notice he was talking about aim and he was talking about truth being bounded inside love. And since boundaries are one of my <laughs> favorite topics that really caught my attention. I took notes on what he said just in, in, for people who might not have been able to hear him very clearly. He was saying, love is the wish that things would be good. The attempt to orient yourself toward making things better predicated on a deep appreciation for being despite its suffering and deficiencies, a decision to act to move things toward the good. That's what sets the parameters of the aim. It's the opposite of the Mephistophelian attitude. It's the decision to open your heart to existence. It's in that framework that truth takes place. Truth has to serve something. Truth has to be bounded inside something, and that's what it's bounded inside. So before I go any further, would you like to comment on that little clip? Yes. 
I know the audience hasn't read the essay necessarily that we read together, the essay or the lecture, however one wants to rehearse it, but I wish they would have because Peterson is on the same string in the piano as Murdoch is, right? They're making the same argument. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, there's even speaking to the same class of opposition, assuming their opponent's argument, which is that the key to a good life is unbounded restrictions and the exercise of the will. Because the opponents of Murdoch and the opponents of a Petersonian uprightness would be to say that the self is located in the will. That's where you are in what you do. And Peterson says, yes, okay, but you can't just go out and do anything. We're not all manners of possibility. And so when he speaks to this lane, or as you put it, this boundary, and opening the heart to existence, he's speaking synonymously of you're in a room, attend to what is available, not to what is possible, because I can go on CNN and see a portal into all things that are not available to me to act upon, but I can cheat myself into thinking my heart is open to all those starving people in another country or to all of those ideologically militant people on the coast. But I have no ability to express my will, even if I suppose I am really my will inside and that is all I am. Similar to Descartes saying, what am I and what, in other words, can I be most certain that I am? Is it my race? No, because that may be an accident of some ancestor adapting somewhere with someone or falling in love with someone of another ethnicity. What am I really beyond doubt? And for him, that was the cogito, the cogitare, the thinking. What is the thinking? How do we picture it? Murdoch goes into, well, it's like Kant would say, some middle distance between a machine and a fully unbounded possibility. This idea of wings opening, possibility, but within the wings, the beating heart of some mechanism. That's what we are. We're some befuddled middle ground bargain of machine and infinite possibility. And that's where the excitement of discovering your identity comes in trying things, failing, trying again, failing, trying again, failing. That's all you can ever do. But, but we're not the whole universe and we can't go and fail on the moon. So when Peterson says, find your lane and open your heart to what is available and you're inside that, you're not outside looking at it. You're inside it. It conditions you. He's speaking to what Murdoch said, except Murdoch was saying, she made it very concrete. When you look at a piece of art and you gaze upon it, you are calling that by attending to it reality. It's not something you're in the middle. Maybe it's real. Maybe it's not really beautiful. I'm going to decide. It's no, if it's real art and not sentimental, it proves its reality by gripping your attention and therefore gripping you. And Peterson's saying the same thing. He's using the word love. Do you think he's earned it? Do you think he's really using that word or is he taping that word onto some structure he's building? That's a really interesting question. So, um, and rather than answer it from my standpoint, I'm gonna to try to answer it from what I see as Iris Murdoch's standpoint. Um, at one point she's talking about prayer. I'm on page 53 right now. She says, prayer is properly not petition, but simply an attention to God, which is a form of love. So it's this very attentive gaze, this focus on God, which prayer is a focus on and 
and I, and as Peterson said, uh, an assumption of good intent, willingness to open your heart up to that entity because you trust that that entity has a good intent is moving towards the good. So prayer in that sense is sort of a, a reciprocal act of love. You're receiving the love from God. You're giving the love back to God saying, I trust you. Now that may not be what she's saying, but that's how that sentence reads to me. So then she goes on and she's talking about Let's take the notion of an object of attention. <clears throat> if, you, um, if you're filled with all sorts of random emotions, you know, they always say when, when you're thinking of the elephant, and if somebody brings up the idea of an elephant, you can't stop thinking of the elephant because now it's, it's captured your attention, it's captured your focus. So you can't will yourself to stop thinking about the elephant. The only real option you have is to change your orientation. So instead of focusing on the ele elephant, you find something else to focus on. So you shift your attention. And it's that shift of attention that enables you to let go of this original thought, okay? Um, she says that god attended to is a powerful source of often good energy that 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 that, that is a psychological fact that attending to god is a powerful source of often good energy and we can all receive moral help by focusing our attention upon things which are valuable like virtuous people great art and so forth um so she's talking a lot about this idea of attention and she goes from there to looking at the order of virtues and finally talks about good being um, in that order of virtues. I can't remember exactly. She's, she's talking about the idea of transcendence. But a few pages later, she says that goodness is a form of realism. And what she means there is that when you attend to the real, you're attending to realism is um, aside from fantasy, not fantasy. And, and here's where I see her talking when you said that they're both tackling the same enemy. The enemy is this fantastical thinking that I can make the world what I want it to be. I can develop a utopia in my mind and I can insist that everybody else sees the same utopia that I do and everybody else works towards the same utopia that I want. And in, in that way, I can exert my will on everybody else to look at my utopia. But that's not what goodness is. Goodness takes the real for what it is. Goodness is willing to look at the real and accept it and say, okay, this is the way the world is. There's a lot of suffering here. There's a lot of pain but I'm going to open my heart to this existence and I'm going to turn my attention to the good and see what I can do to bring about a good effect rather than allowing things to de degenerate into the bad while I'm off here wandering around in my fantasy. That's such a good way to put it. Wandering off into my fantasy while the world burns or what is the same thing, while all the infrastructure of our grandfathers rusts into oblivion because of our idle hands. And I know that sounds like, uh, oh, Matt, where are your overalls? Because you're trying to get us to go back to the 1930s where trucks didn't work and everyone was a jack of all trades. Well, Iris Murdoch intellectually is arguing for a jack of all trades, except she puts it, as you pointed out, in the language of virtue ethics. She uses energy precisely. Not to give away the ending, but she points out in this essay that the proposition God exists is for her tenuous and she's not willing to entertain mm -hmm. it. However, she uses energies, it seems to me, not in a materially reduce, re reductive way. I don't think she intends by the word energy, the wobbling of atoms and the giving off, the spraying 
of electrons because she she brings it into the matrix de definition of virtue so energy and courage one of her examples mm -hmm. how do you know when someone let's put the idea of what a person is to the side how do you know how do you recognize when someone is being courageous it seems to me that murdoch is saying there is something behind them that moves through and then represents out and this person becomes an avatar or icon for in their physical instantiation in their motor movements in their words so in a vervakian sense what might be and this is a phrase she uses often right this idea that we have and it has its roots in the 20th century that there could be such a thing as ordinary language and a neutral worldview where we all find ourselves and if we if we were moderate we would stay in most of the time and these people that go out and pray or go on retreats or um, get married and really hold to it in a spiritual way i mean they're, they're the fringe type going out into the unknown and it might work it might not in the same way that when you jump out of an airplane the uh, parachute might work or it might not but we both recognize they're doing something against normal laws when they jump out of a plane they're trying to be more than what they are and it might not work and usually there's some artificial mechanism that will allow them to survive such a thing as marriage long-term love things that cannot be uh, put into words succinctly courage i mean how do you know when to run into a burning building are there laws for that actually there aren't <laughs> um, positive laws a lot of negative laws of how not to be negligent but to really run in and be courageous uh, it's difficult to put that into language so how do you conceptualize that in an in an when the assumption is there's this neutral place with ordinary language and she doesn't believe such a thing exists a normal world with ordinary language she thought that was uh, a fiction of the british empiricists did what and and so all that to say is preface if a courageous person for example walks onto the scene and they become iconized where the energy rushes through and now they suddenly know i will run into the burning building and they they run quite fast and they come out with the child and they don't ask for pictures to be taken we say my goodness there was a combination this excellent accolade of virtues where they were quick to act they didn't deliberate like hamlet they were shy afterwards with humility and they actually ran into a burning building so as she points out when you find one virtue and you start to analyze it you do not find what you what she found in modern universities namely a diversification of fields and specialization into points mm -hmm. sociology is not psychology psychology is not sociology and that's certainly not civic government and that's certainly not civil engineering and that's definitely not theology she said instead what you find in a ethical analysis of virtue all of them come attendant when you notice one and without all of them following you wouldn't have the rush of any one virtue into reality and she finds that quite curious and damning to the over specialists in her philosophic field like Wittgenstein like uh, Bertrand Russell anybody who would anal analyze language independent of human behavior well let me step back a little bit and not look at it so much from the standpoint of language but take those same ideas and look at it from the standpoint going back to her word of good what what is good and um, at one point she says what is a good man like we don't know very much we don't know very many what we would call good men and so she uses two examples, Socrates and Jesus Christ. 
And she says, what characterizes them is the simplicity and directness of their diction, which colors our conception of them as good. And so I got thinking about simplicity and directness. And again, she uses the word simple and straightforward. She said, when someone is simple and straightforward with their diction, it gives you the impression of authority. You remember when Jesus was walking the earth, people would always say, oh, he speaks as one with authority. They were used to people getting up and gabbing at them and preaching at them and so forth, but it didn't come across to them as being authoritative. But Jesus spoke as with authority, as if he actually had at his command all the laws that he was talking about. And uh, looking at, so just thinking about simple and complex, I was thinking, huh. So if, if we see someone who is very simple in their diction and in their very straightforward in their behavior, where you, you get the sense that everything that they do has a direction. It's not coming in from the side. It's not trying to divert your attention or distract you or um, get you to shift one way or another, but it's just very straightforward, right? So that kind of simple actually clarifies things using simple language clarifies things complex tends to obscure things so when you use simple and direct language it actually requires a lot of depth of knowledge and wisdom in order to use simple language to convey meaning because simple language that is not undergirded by all that depth of knowledge and wisdom just comes across like a cliche but when there's a lot of wisdom underneath it then it just cuts through like an arrow yes yes that is true so this is where love and truth when jordan peterson was talking about love and truth what is the relative relationship between those and what i heard him saying was that Love is kind of the natural boundary of truth. So when, when we speak truth, truth is supposed to be spoken in love. So in a sense, truth needs to inhabit love in order to, to be meaningful and to bring about a good result a good consequence so in a sense when something is very simple it's got all sorts of complexity folded up inside of it right mm -hmm. it's like a, a huge data compression so if jesus is the ultimate good because and we can recognize that because of his simplicity it's because all of the complexity of the universe is folded up inside, <laughs> right? So um, anyway, that's what I was thinking about. No, no, that's, I'm, I'm tracking with you. And I think that's the right route to go, namely to, to look at the relationship between complexity and simplicity as the, as the point of departure for Murdoch and Peterson. Peterson calls it chaos and order. Murdoch called it the, the fiction or the fantasy and the real. And we call it the, sim the complex and the simple. But we're all three, all four doing the same thing, namely looking for a place that seems solid to depart from and think and and act in harmony with that thinking but philosophers have always done this they take so much care to define the boundary of their point of departure because as the saying goes if you begin on sand it doesn't matter how fine the materials are or 
how exquisite your skills you're building on a foundation that is um, irreparable. But if you, be, if you find out that great piece of real estate or an axiom that seems impregnable, then, then the rest is a matter of course and can become a joy, can become a joy to live. And I think Murdoch would agree here. It can become a joy to live out your principles. It can be wonderful to be energized by reality, by the truth, and to love in concord with what love is and not something you've osmotically absorbed from some Fifty Shades of Grey substitute on the market from a guru in a song. And Descartes is to blame. These, these philosophers since the 17th century, and I found this in Kierkegaard because over 40%, something like this, of Kierkegaard's journals are him writing simultaneously his appreciation for and his profound disagreement with Descartes. And I bring up Descartes because he had a pretension of simplicity that I think if we, and I've been reading his meditations, if we take him at his word, we think, wow, that's, that sounds noble. But it's, it's the opposite. It's something in the spirit of what Michael was talking about in his last conversation with you about how tricky modern avatars of the Luciferian, I use that in the Murdoch sense, I don't pretend to know what's motivating them. But in the sense of, here's her phrase, the adventure of the will, she uses that somewhere in the essay, how modern avatars of the adventuresome will owe their worldview, their thinking to Descartes in his meditations. Because Descartes said, I'm a humble man. I can't know everything. Which in Murdochian language is, I can't express all the virtues at once. I'm probably not the sort of guy to run into a burning building and save the child, even if it was mine. And isn't it great that I can be sincere enough to admit that? People clap. Oh, the authenticity. Oh, the, the grace that must descend upon you, Descartes, to admit your sin. Join our flock. Wow, if only I could be as open and raw. These words, raw and open and sincere. And Murdoch hates that, right? She doesn't like the word sincere. She thinks it's melodramatic. Um, it's a work of fiction. And he says, well, since that's really me, how can I begin to know anything? And one of his principles was, I take something complex and I make it simple by taking away the things I don't need right now. And you think, because he's using the word humble as a philosopher, namely taking away all the normal associations we'd have with this word, and he uses it in his own idiom. So... Someone who doesn't look for it will think, oh, he's talking about humility. But no, he's talking about what he wants to talk about with a word that we've grown up with, which is exactly what Heidegger did with the word being, <laughs> which is what Murdoch is doing with the word reality and fiction and fantasy. Well, uh, so is this, kind of, is this kind of like when Michael talks about data compression, he talks about lossless and lossy. So lossless data compression, when you, when you click the button and it comes back, it comes back with all the data there again. When it's lossy, I think, you click the button, it comes back, and you get the general idea, but there's some pieces missing. So it sounds like you're saying that Descartes was, was um, taking complex ideas and trying to make them simple and accessible, but he did it in a very lossy way, where he lossy. lost a lot of the, the underlying deep truth of what was there. Or maybe it was more like when Jefferson used to cut pieces out of the Bible that he didn't want. That's a great more word like picture that. for it. Oh, that's, it, I didn't think that before, but I could not agree more now. And, and the reason I say that is this, in, in one of his meditations, and I promise this relates to what we're talking about, the, he, admit, he prefaces and admits his faith in God. So he's using the proposition in Vervakian language of faith and in God, and he's, 
He says everything but a hallelujah at the end. And he participates. I mean, he was, I'm sure, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that he prayed and he knew the scriptures and he studied them. Even if he said he studied them for world history, I bet he studied them. And the other piece of John Verveke's four ways of knowing things. He was certainly procedural because he was writing procedures, et cetera, et cetera. But in his attempt to acquire what for him was self-certain foundations for all that he could know or pretend to teach someone, he had to take away everything that even, that even admitted of addition. So if he gave you a proposition and you said, oh yeah, and he'd say, oh, that means I don't really know what I'm talking about. Because if you can add something to what I've just said, then how do I not know you could add an infinite number of things? Which may mean that I haven't even begun to learn what I'm talking about. And if I have not even begun to learn what I am talking about, then I'm not saying anything productive. I'm reaching instead of grasping. And he thought that was a problem. The problem of problems, how to begin to know. So like I said earlier with finding a point of departure, he thought that was just the human situation, is we're never in a point to ever depart and act in accordance with what we know to be true. So this whole idea from Murdoch of we can have energies coursing through us that give us the ability to act with courage, speak with honesty, love without restriction. He thought, I can't even begin to do any of those things because everything I say might be wrong because it could be added to into oblivion. And that's, I mean, with the internet, we have a, a word picture of you and I could say something and if we were public figures, anybody could go on the internet and check, fact check every syllable of our sentences. And there's, I'm sure, someone somewhere out there who has a piece of data that could be added and slightly change the whole fabric of what we are purportedly giving. And that could make someone think, well, I'll never really know anything, not even a little, because it can always be added to or argued away with. So he thought, the only thing I can say without addition is I am thinking. I am the sort of thing that thinks, that entertains ideas and holds up information. No and he thought that was a valueless judgment on his being. It wasn't good, it wasn't bad, it wasn't right, it wasn't wrong, it's just the default state of what it is to be Descartes. And by extension, any person. But you notice that simplicity is taking all the words around it, all the things like you said of Jefferson's Bible, and even putting a whiteout on faith in God. Now, he can do the Immanuel Kant move and say, well, the freedom I have with my conscience and the God that I say I believe in, I can have those back, and you can't add to them or take away from them. But it's, I can't say they're in the real world, external to my experience, because you could add to that. You could take away from that. But if I put them down deep into the well of subjectivity, you can't reach it. What I lose is there's no objective correlate, no picture that can actually represent what I'm talking about when I say God, freedom, conscience, and love. But I can say I am the sort of thing that can think about those things. I just can't be right or wrong or close or far from them. It's, and I don't, and you, Kierkegaard said like in conclusion that he, <laughs> what, did, what did you say? It's like you lose everything when you make that move, but go ahead. What did Kierkegaard say? That's what, that's, I think that's why Kierkegaard didn't marry and why he gave his life to writing philosophical, hard to read texts. Like, I, I don't think he should have given up Regina. I don't think he should have been a hermit, in my opinion. However, 
this, that giving up of everything, like you said, and he said this in his journals, gripped him so much as an error, a, a, an error in the soul that a person could not be saved if they participated in Descartes' project of doubt in everything except that we're the sort of things that can think and entertain everything. He thought that was a fissure, a, a gap that would destroy everything we hold dear. We couldn't have institutions with that gap. We couldn't have families with that gap. We couldn't even have self-respect with that gap. And it drove Kierkegaard to identify faith with passion or pathos. I think he was wrong for doing that because it, it, it winds up just being my subjective, irrational, cannot represent adventure of the will. Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to go across the world and leave their family behind because that's what their faith is telling them emotionally. Kierkegaard would say you can't argue with that. But he, he had to use that because no one else in his time thought you could get beyond Descartes' doubt. But I think one of the ways you can, and Murdoch, even though she doesn't rehearse these people in their arguments, she's fighting the same battle to preserve what's between those two things. And say, that's the whole world between them. You can't separate, you can't erase the whole world and just say you have your subjective faith and your objective thinking machine that you are. There's a whole world between, and we need all of it. And otherwise, we're just people who say things. I'm a Christian, without having the whole sacramental, energized collection of virtues that make us run into burning buildings to embrace our husband and wives, to really be friends, and to say, I'm a child of God, without irony. I think she's fighting for that, and I think that's why she uses art, because for her, she could point at a Van Gogh and say, it seems to be inexhaustible, doesn't it? Well, that's the way reality is. There's no part of it that you can actually separate in a Descartian way from what you are right now enjoying. So if it's true in that little painting of the Mona Lisa, it's also true of a walk down the park or attendance in church or in the still silent recess of your heart. Now, if she would have said that, it would have sounded like a cliche where she was speaking in Oxford. But like you said, with simple language, Jesus was direct. Pray like this to your father. And then he didn't go on and qualify the word father ad nauseum. He just let it lie there. God is father. What do you, what do you think of, of that movement? Well, because it brings us back to attention and this idea of prayer being um, an attention to God, a focus on God and to that attention being a form of love. And I think that's the only move that you, so I'm not, I never, I read a little bit of Descartes in college, but nobody ever explained it to me the way you just did. So I didn't really get it. I didn't pay any attention to it. It just came and went. It wasn't important. I, I had another life back then, you know? And, uh, and I certainly never read any Kierkegaard. And so listening to you is like kind of drinking from a fresh water fountain and learning all these new things. It's really great. But listening to you talk about it, it seems clear to me that Descartes' error was that he, he condemned himself to a constant reciprocal narrowing. Because if it's all inside me, then everything is about me. It's all about self. And once you start because the deep principle, the very deep principle that's here is that you become like what you focus on. So if I focus on me and I focus on my inner thoughts and all of that, then, then the more I do that, the more I'm going to become like what I am inside. And the more I do that, the more. I, and so pretty soon I've reciprocally narrowed down to where it's just me and this tiny little knot. And, and there's no, um, there's no meaning, there's no complexity or anything else. But if I focus on that good that's above the horizon, the highest good of which I can think that Jordan Peterson always talks about, or Esther, I mean, Iris Murdoch is talking about 
shifting your attention to that which is good, if I put my attention there and I really focus on that and act out of that attention, then the whole world opens up. Then I have a reciprocal broadening that takes in this entire field of possibility that's in front of me, which of course, you know, Jordan Peterson talks about what is going to give you a frame that you can actually act within and the focus on the highest good makes the things that are useful to you come into your frame of reference. And so then you can, you can learn and grow from those things and follow those things and all of that stuff works together. But it seems to me it's, it's either a reciprocal narrowing or a reciprocal broadening and that Descartes just got it wrong. <laughs> he did. And, and with the, um, the Luciferian image, uh, so if any of your viewers have read uh, Paradise Lost, I think we see a, a beautiful orchestration of that narrowing where this figure is next to God, the top of the angelic hierarchy. There is a, a sense of real virtue coursing through his cells. He is the pinnacle, the apex of an angel. And because of one little Achilles heel, namely, he would not give his will to one higher than him. The consequence was not being demoted five angels down. Maybe he'll learn. It was all the way an infinite number of angels down to himself, which is equivalent to all the angels down. And so when he was in hell, he said, and this was proof that he could go down no further, I, through spite of the creator, can make a heaven hell and my hell heaven. Exactly what you just said, in my opinion, maps on to how the body and the mind and the soul can be in a place that, to another person's pair of eyes, is bliss, streams of water, fresh fruit, but because of a choice they made, they are in hell, and there's no way you can take them out. Even if you tie their hands behind their back, make them sit down and look at a flower slowly for hours, bloom, it will not sink in that they are in heaven because they are lost. And that's, to me, the terrifying reality of reality. It's where all the consequences are. If you want to know where reality is, just look at a consequence. That is reality. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a number that we've, said measures acceleration due to gravity that's not <laughs> real that's a number that we say yeah. semantically maps on to reality which is just telling you a story it's an interpretation but the moment and this is a petersonian insight the moment you feel pain which is this cardinal instance of reality's consequence the moment you are evoked with pain there's no interpretation yet that is the real. That is a consequence. When you are, in a Kierkegaardian sense, lost, and you don't know you're lost because you are only with yourself, that is the same thing as being in pain without knowing you're in pain. So you'll never get out of that pain. You'll never be helped because you never experience the symptom because you are so lost, you cannot be found. And it, it brings me back to why, how important repentance is. Not as some you know, marker or some tally that people have or some archaic fossil from uh, the library of theology. Repentance is a orchestration of how we find ourselves in a reality, in a consequence. Like as you're dancing with someone, 
If your left foot goes to the right place, it's a good consequence. If it goes to a bad one on their toe, you're in a bad place. <laughs> you brought a person with you. And now what you do next with that person, what they do with you matters. And all the while you're repenting. And people say, oh, that's not real repentance. That's not theological. That's just etiquette. No, like if, if Murdoch is right, all the virtues come together. They're never, in a Descartian sense, isolated one from the other to be studied with precision. It'd be like saying, I stepped on your toe. I'm sorry. It doesn't mean I'm a sinner. No, man, you don't even know what you're doing. You're doing a Descartian bifurcation by admitting there's this thing in an ordinary world called a misstep that is far removed from a theological damning of the soul. Man, there's one world. <laughs> it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why she talks about a need for a background in moral philosophy, where the, she thought her contemporaries didn't give a background. They just thought, well, we can study present moments and analogize that to computer output input functions. And basically, that's a human will. So let's understand preferences, let's make them comfortable in a room, give them a career with nice promotional steps, and we'll call that a human life. They'll pay their taxes that way. Like that's a it's it's such a corrupt view of humanity, humanity, because we think we know, we think we're talking about something, but we're not. We're just throwing a bunch of correlations together so quickly and giving each other peer pressure to see the same elephant that isn't there, that if you start to say, it's pretty fragile, all those correlations you're making, it doesn't actually add up to a picture, it doesn't have a line, it doesn't have the complexity, it doesn't have the shading. I mean, then you're just you're trying to be difficult, are you anathema? Um, and she didn't have a liturgical tradition, she wasn't religious, she couldn't point to a sacred text, so she just said, it doesn't feel right, it's not a good piece of art. That was her go-to. Mm -hmm. Well, here's another thing that she said that I thought was really interesting because she makes some she makes some leaps here, some comparisons with language that were really new for me. I mean, I'd never heard anybody talk about these connections. She says, to reach truth, self-interest must fade. The realism required for goodness is the intellectual ability to perceive what is true and is automatically at the same time a suppression of self. So there is a realism required for goodness. Goodness can't be found or achieved outside of realism. So you can't get there through fantasy. <laughs> Right? I mean, fantasy was the, the, the thing that she put over against truth, truth and fantasy. So you can't, you, can't get, you can't get to goodness by a fantasy. You can only get to goodness by a realism. And, and to, be empath to, be, to empathize with Descartes, I think he would have said to that proposition of yours, amen and amen. That's why. I want to take away anything someone could add to with another version of the story. So I could see how someone would, would reduce all the way down to themselves and yet think they're doing it in all humility. Like, mm -hmm. let me go away for 10 years, not talk to anyone, shut off my phone. I don't want any influence, right? Because I just want to find the real things first. Well, so I, here's what it comes down to then is this picture of the suppression of self. What does she mean when she says that? And I don't, That's a good question. Yeah, so I don't think she means by that, oh, I'm nothing. I am of no value. It's not important that I'm a complex being. I'm just going to suppress all of that, and I'm just going to fit into this slot, whatever this slot is, okay? I don't think that's what she means at all. I think what she means is more this idea of when she's talking about Jesus Christ being the reason we think of him as good is we see his beautiful simplicity, which is really his beautiful clarity, which if you stop and think about it is really his beautiful transparency. It's like looking through a clear glass, right? There's no 
there's no dirt or muck on the glass and there's nothing that um, alters your vision looking through. It's all just really clear and, and beautiful and simple and yet beautifully complex and deep and powerful and you know with with all of the it's got all the all of reality in there it's not um it's not looking through a glass at the number one on a blackboard it's not that kind of simple it's a different kind of simple right that was a beautiful so, analogy so when you suppress self what that means is that you're you're to the greatest extent possible, you're trying to make your life transparent like that, clear. Let me add a description to that, because I think you are so insightful in what you did with transparency and personhood. I think often in our cognitive milieu, that is to say what the 20th century philosophers did to all of us, is we have to speak what's going on and what can happen. And speaking comes out of the front side of our bodies and it goes ahead of us. So when we say, for instance, I have faith in, phenomenologically, we feel as if we're making a statement about future events because that's where the words are going. We're facing the future, speaking to it about its reality, and we're holding on to that. We don't want to be driven to the right or to the left by all these naysayers. We don't want distractions from this future. But when you talked about being transparent, it's taking that nose, being led by the nose of faith, and turning it around and having a faith in what's behind us, supporting us. What, what allows us motivation. And I think that's so important not just because in the Bible, Jesus says, when you go and witness on my behalf to your own people and to the rulers, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, people who've read their Bible, they know how to think ahead. And when you witness about me, do not tell yourself, like he was very stern with them. I don't know what the word is in Greek, but he said, decide in yourselves before you go there. You will not premeditate a speech because when you arrive the holy spirit will give you the words now that all sounds like oh yes let's make a song about that and absolutely we should those are simple divine bottomless words but to connect it with your concept one of the things he's saying is trust in the energies Believe that virtue is not something you appropriate from the world in the same way a political pundit looks around at his audience, knows their demographic, and then matches the words. So he get a, gets a bunch of hits and claps. Instead, believe that independent of your audience and your place and your time, virtue is independent. And virtue is equivalent to energy. And energy isn't based on you or your society or your resources. It's transcendent from God in the form of the Holy Spirit coming behind and illuminating you and directing your speech and choosing the words. And if you try to think about a way to tap into that or access that, you're using rhetoric, you're using your world, stop it. Just show up, like we say for an interview. If you show up, that's half the battle. Just show up and believe in God and he will show up. And people experience that all the time when they do it. Wow, I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know I could do that. Like Paul said, it is not I, but Christ in me. Mm -hmm. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I think you're right on the money. Well, when the we are transparent. That is that the beautiful part of that is that when you're really depending on the Holy Spirit to speak, then you don't need to be the one who knows everything about everybody's needs so that you know exactly what to say to meet their needs because God already knows all their needs. So he knows what they need to hear, but behind and underneath that, I think there also is, um, there are also all the other verses that talk about being prepared 
be, be prepared so that when you are asked a question, the words are there. So it's important that we. That's an interesting, I kind of want to push back on that though, because it's interesting the way, Paul, uh, I don't know who you're thinking of in which part, but what came to my mind was St. Peter's injection of have a defense, mm -hmm. a reasonable defense for the faith that is in you. It's a very interesting paradoxical juxtaposition because he doesn't say have faith in the reasonable defense you will give that it will make clear what you're doing to someone. Mm -hmm. He's saying have a reasonable defense for the faith. Mm-hmm. That it, so it's, how it's, is that a pushback? I, I'm I'm not I'm not tracking. Because it's almost like saying it's better to have a reason not to come prepared than to have a reason and be prepared with it. You lost me. It's better to have I, I didn't I've never thought about this till now as you brought it up. So I, I think we'll have to we'll find it together because i've never thought this thought before but in fact i believe peter is arguing for a paradox he's not arguing for something straightforward because normally if the logos if a rational discourse is the goal then how do we get there do we have to have reasons for our reasons uh so to get if, if i if i'm going into a room and the people are gonna to look to me for some answers about something. Is it better that I say, okay, give me five days so I can learn about this something and at least do my, what we like to call due diligence, whatever that means. That's actually an infinite regress because I'm gonna use day one of the five to say, okay, what does due diligence look like? Whoa, I need to go back and figure out what due diligence is. Well, you get to day three and you're still thinking about the history of due diligence. And by the day, the time you're at day four, you might start on the something. And by day five, you have probably like five different ways of approaching that something. And so by the time you walk into that room, you're just saying, well, here are seven, 13 ways of looking at the something. But if instead you say, mm, I don't need five days, let's go in right now. Whoa, man, you haven't prepared. I don't need to. Why? Here's why. And then you give him your, your theology or your metaphysics or your cosmology, and you tailor it in such a way that it answers why you don't need to be prepared to speak to this group at this time. I, maybe that's what you were saying, but it sounds like a paradox. Well, but it's also like, in you, a way, how, coherent. How do, you have a how do you have a metaphysics or a cosmology if you've never studied any of these things or, or built a framework or read, read things or read read the scriptures i mean what I, a great what a great pushback that, that's yeah. that's amazing i honestly don't know and i want to come back and push at it with well maybe these things play a reverse leapfrog with one another where okay i i'll have a reason for why i don't need to be prepared okay well where are you going to get that reason <laughs> like you said that's really good i guess i, I don't have a reason for getting that reason well, how do you know you don't need a reason for that reason so you don't need to prepare for this speech? Basically, what you do when you have that infinite chain going back of these things leapfrogging each other, I think it's a way of rehearsing Iris Murdoch's problem. How do you know if you're dealing with fantasy or reality? Well, we tend to think you need a set of reasons for accepting this piece as either in the real bucket or the fantasy bucket. And those reasons that criteria is independent of what you think about reality and what you think of fantasy but i can almost hear michael right now saying but there's no place that that criteria can exist right because if you're saying it has to be independent of your thoughts your preconceptions of reality and independent of your preconceptions of fantasy where does it go there's no place for it to go and so you're either borrowing a little bit from fantasy or a little bit from reality but if you do that you haven't actually answered the the problem and you were back at square one of what is it really which way and wow well now hold on so, so when you're yeah. talking having reasons maybe you're thinking about something different than i am because i think there's a there's probably a vast difference between speaking wisdom and arguing using reasons I go mean, ahead those are two different things 
tell me more. Tell me more. Well, I mean, when I think of people having reasons, I usually think that they've studied the great philosophers and they've studied logic and rhetoric and all of these things. And so they can spool out their syllogisms and, and all of that kind of stuff. And I obviously can't do that. And yet, because I've been reading God's word and thinking about art things and other things like that, my mind puts together certain ideas, and so they come down to certain principles, which seem to me to be bedrock principles upon which a person can live their life. Because really, what use is philosophy if it doesn't lead you towards something that will allow you to live your life in a way that you're benefiting other people and, mm -hmm. and finding your own way through life and finding purpose and meaning and, and ultimately finding God? what's the otherwise philosophy is just a bunch of intellectualizing so um but i think even not necessarily that you have to have read a lot of books there are a lot of you know old washer women who were very deep wise old women because they lived life and they they knew just enough of god's word to know what life meant and they were able to put that together and become immensely wise and help a lot of people so you don't have to be an intellect in order to be wise and in order to be um, someone that people can go to for counsel so um yeah i guess that's what i'm thinking no I, it's but i wanted to go back i wanted to go yeah. back to the um I want to go back to this thing about the fantasy and the and the virtue yeah because you were talking about the virtue being um that in any one virtue the exercise of any one virtue you tend to find a lot of other virtues tied up and there's a famous quote of i think it's is it gk chesterton or c.s lewis says that courage is is the virtue that you find at the at the limits of every other virtue mm -hmm when you when you come to the limit of your patience and you're ready to let it rip you know courage is what helps you keep going when you reach the limit it helps you keep going or um when you reach the limits of persistence you know any 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 virtue that you're working on when you reach the limits of it that that's when courage kicks in so there, there's always this interplay of virtues, but she says um, along about page 68, which is getting towards the end of the chapter, she said, the same virtues, in the end, the same virtue, and she puts love in parentheses, they're required throughout. And fantasy, and in parentheses, she puts self, because this fantasy is actually the self, can prevent us from seeing a blade of grass just as it can prevent us from seeing another person. And so what occurred to me when I read that is that, so there's, this is going back to what I said before, there's two alternatives. You can either focus on self or you can focus on the good. If you focus on self, then you just get more of the same. If you focus on the good, you get a broadening there. And that when you focus on the self, you can't really see. You can't really see others. You can't really see another person. You can't really see even a work of art. You can't see the beauty in a work of art. You can't see the complexity of a blade of grass because you're all wound up in every single thing that you see you know is this good for me what's in it for me am i you know is there an obstacle there for me <laughs> is there something that's going to keep me from getting what i want so me gets all wound up in everything if my focus is on self so i can't i don't have a clear vision so this vision thing seems to me it's not only a clear vision looking out and being able to see out clearly because my focus isn't on self 
it's also a clear vision looking in so that when others look at me they see a person who is they see integrity or clarity or they see they can see through me like seeing through a glass right so the clarity of vision goes both ways does that make sense yeah um it reminds me of what Peterson was talking about with his word use of the word uh, funestai. Yes. Thank you. Um, where the light that enters allow it hits our receptors, photoreceptors, and brings an upside down image up upright, so we can perceive the tree. Well, what we're also doing is we are emitting, or at least the ancients thought we were emitting things out into a kind of space and that's what came to us what we gave came to us and that's really it's interesting how the use of the word projection and so when people will say on the street oh you're just projecting into the world all your baggage and maybe you need to go and talk to a counselor because once you you get all through your therapy and route out the skeletons from your closet and your parents you can go out into the world and see it for what it is but that's that still assumes this ordinary world with ordinary language that if people would just not do excessive things they would be in but it's far more complex than that it's not that i'm hiding anything from my past or that i'm too far from normal see it's that there's this fight against harmonizing what's coming in and what's going out. And I think that's a, a, what you pointed out is a good way to think about goodness, which is out there and real, Murdoch wants to argue. And what would she say? A kind of forthright, virtue to meet it and to move towards it and not say with any irony i am moving towards perfection closer to the perfect object and through my attention myself becoming perfect for it and as it is perfect for me and when you say that to another person someone starts to yell where's the ring because we honor that as pure and good, both subjectively and objectively. And it's so easy to get out of that mode. Like you had said earlier in our conversation, I thought you said it so well, to allow a sort of diversion from a side, this tactic to distract attention away from. And it could be something as harmless as an extra word in a sentence. Oh, it sounds good. Yes, but it distracts from the whole. And by doing that, you're taking them out of this focus, which may not have behind it a malicious intent, but objectively, I can say it is bad because you're costing the person their perfection. And so she uses that word perfect. Go ahead, go ahead. When you say perfection there, it sounded, the, w the way you were describing it sounded like you were actually talking about like being fitted. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. right? Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Like, it's got to be, it's got to be like evoked as this click and this. Like the stones in the living temple being carved out so that they fit perfectly with each other when they're built together, right? The capstone, the keystone, like you had said somewhere. Well, Yes, that that too. But I mean, even all the stones in the living temple, all the stones in the the stones in the living temple were dressed or were because they didn't use mortar in the old days. They just used to use stones and they had to be chipped out so that they fit together perfectly so that they were stable with each other. So it's that that word perfect really has to do with that being fitted so that you fit together with, you know, I'm so glad you said that because it works well with that, reality, right? So if we fit with reality, the more that we align with reality, the more we are aligning with truth. Yes. And 
the more we align with reality, the more we're aligning with truth. And why would someone want to do that? Because they are in love. And they want to love. So notice the preposition. They're in it. And they want that as their purpose for being. So why are you building the structure with gravity and not mortar? Because I want to live in it. And I want it to be. So now take that word image and apply it to a man running into a burning building. Philosophically, Murdoch is making the argument, when we watch someone run into a burning fire, a burning building, a firefighter, the reason we stand in awe and respect is we are spiritually, aesthetically, in a church looking at this high rise of rocks, everyone perfectly fitted, without accident, without embellishment, without distraction. And we are raptured into it. And we are also drawing it into ourselves. When I watch a basketball player, I get a little bit of, wow, that was amazing skill. I also get a little bit of, man, I maybe should go outside and dribble the ball every once in a while. But it's like saying, that person just used a word I didn't know about. Let me go look that up in the dictionary. I want to include that word. It's like stealing a, a Jenga piece and destroying the whole structure. You can't have honesty without courage. You can't have patience without steadfastness. You can't have thrift without purity. The moment you just say, hey, no, I'll start with one, thank you very much. I'm not gonna try for a Hail Mary. <laughs> you're making a Descartian move that you're, you shouldn't be, because well, and it doesn't- Here's where the other thing, this is where the rubber hits the road, I think, is that you can't have any of those things if you're not acting. Otherwise, they're just words, they're just, you're just talking. Because Elaborate talking, though, because I'm curious what you mean. Well, when you're talking about looking at a firefighter running into a burning building and we stand with awe and admiration. I've heard young people from Generation Z and, and even some from the millennial generation say things like this. Well, why do, you, why do you laud these cops and these firefighters for being brave? That's what they're paid for, isn't it? So that's the move that's being made today. And the only reason they can make that move is that they have never had to face that choice. You know, who was it that once said, rough men stand ready to, to do terrible things on our behalf so that we can sleep soundly in our beds at night? We don't have to go out and protect ourselves. We don't have to keep guns in our house to take care of ourselves. We don't have to be prepared to fight fires because somebody else will come and do it for us. And we used to look at that as amazing images of great virtue and, and uh, something that we could really admire and be drawn towards and be inspired by. And now it's like, well, you know, that's what they get paid for, isn't it? They should just suck it up. If, if they don't want to do that, they should just quit. Are, are, we have generations of people who have lost the capacity for beauty and the capacity for um, admiration. And I think it's just, well, here's one of her quotes that I thought really described this generation. She says, it is in the capacity to love, that is to see, she uses that move again, you know, to love is to see clearly that the liberation of the soul from fantasy consists. The freedom, which is a proper human goal, is the freedom from fantasy. That is the realism of compassion. What I have called fantasy, the proliferation of blinding self-centered aims and images is itself a powerful system of energy, and most of what is often called will or willing belongs to this system. That's she's, what she's describing there is this utopian 
system of Marx, Marxian uh, culture warriors, blinding self-centered aims and images, a powerful system of energy, right? That's exactly what it's because it's fantasy. It's a fantasy world that they want to force everyone else into. And then she says, what counteracts this system is attention. Attention to reality, inspired by and consisting of love. And that's when she starts talking about art. But I, I think this whole thing about attention is so important because that's Jordan Peterson's whole gig too, you know. You put your focus on the highest good of which you can conceive, and that's the only move you can make that's going to keep you from falling into that pit of despair that's waiting for you if you focus on the fantasy instead. And so I want to I want to make three moves because I agree with I agree with you. I think that is the 21st century Zoomer predicament cynicism but there's this ebullient joy behind their cynicism and i want to empathize with that because they it's not as if they are nihilistic to the core they want to i apologize for the light my bulb is out but yeah the bulb is out you look very philosophical <laughs> oh good 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 um the they want to admire because they're human. And what it means to be human is to be an, okay, I'm gonna go off for a couple seconds. What it means to be human is to be an icon. We are works in progress, in progress. We are not what we will be. We're not even resurrected yet. We're not even alive yet. We're not even in our story yet. We are so primitive and elemental we're the line. We're, I mean, God is still choosing short or long here. Like, the story hasn't even begun, so we do not have proper ideologies. And yet, it can be lonely, and it can be difficult, and it is a, a fight. Paul uses metaphors of fighting and running and conditioning because we are being painted and scratched over and erased through all the mistakes and the errors and the sin, but God never gives up and he adds to and he recomposes and he's building and all things work together for good, but it's happening in real time. And it's not done yet, it can't even go out and walk. So in the meantime, the hubris, the pride is, well, let me go and reach for myself, become God in a moment. I deeply disagree with the beatific vision, that we're gonna have like an intuition of the essence of God. I'm an orthodox, I don't believe we'll ever access the essence of God. But his energies allow us to live a victorious life and in fact is what is saving us and composing us and making us poetry, as Paul said, making us what we will be in resurrected bodies as representations of Christ. The, the, the temptation is, to live now as if we're already resurrected. And so, let me tell everyone what heaven is. Let me force them in if they won't believe me. And then I can begin the story of loving them, being connected to them, and having them use me as I use them. Like we love these epic stories, Game of Thrones, where we can just imagine perfectly developed, self-insulated worlds to lose ourselves in by binging. It's the same move as a social justice warrior saying, Mr. Cop, you're invisible to me. You're just a guy getting paid. What's real is this whole institution of law enforcement. That's the thing that stands for you. And that's the thing my God energizes. He doesn't energize you. You're just nothing. You're just like a mouthpiece for all your biases. I wish you would be educated out of but we don't have time for that. We don't have time for that. They're very cataclysmic. We need to go straight to the institution and stop it from getting all its resource from the God who energizes it. We'll pluck out the law enforcement, we'll rewrite it so that we can have those energies 
properly filtered, we can have our heaven and then we can begin the business of loving one another, exploring reality together. And it sounds good because it is good. They're borrowing, they're cribbing all the language of not my will, your will be done. I don't even care that I'm sounding like a, a crazy person. I just want to stand for those unspoken minorities for the past 2,000 years that have been repressed. Well, they're speaking of the institution has been energized that shouldn't have been. We need to put something new in its place so it can be energized from heaven on earth. Not my will, your will be done. So it's this humongous, I know that's not a word, but this tremendous pride in creating heaven. But it uses the language of not my will, your will be done. So it can come across as humility down to my will. So it's a Descartian move with religious words and tropes. And yet it is the most Luciferian thing. Any human being that didn't want to be simply composed as an icon would do. Like if you think you're in charge of making yourself an icon, then that's precisely what you would do. So at least they're consistent. And I'm not, I'm not damning them. We do it all the time. That's what sin and temp, falling prey to temptation is. Mm -hmm. And in some respect, because of the fall, we can't even help it. Like our natures have been so discombobulated that things just don't line up. And so when they do, it's like this feeling of heaven rushing in for a moment. But all of that is working simultaneously in the world and in academia and in conversations. And so this idea of having patience, Jesus said, by patience, possess your souls. You can't have patience unless you're courageous to be patient. Mm -hmm. And you can't have the courage to be patient unless you're steadfast. And you can't be steadfast unless you believe in something and trust in it. And you can't really trust in something unless you're wise and have studied. And you can't study unless you're meticulous. And you can't be meticulous unless you're patient. <laughs> So it's begging for the very thing it's trying to achieve. And you can't have any of those things unless they are slowly developed in you as a gift of grace. Hmm. And so that's the energy. That's the key right there. Yeah. That's the key right there. Because it, I'll just apply it, this to myself. The like the, oh, all, go ahead, go all ahead. Of the, it's all the activities of your life that provide those opportunities for those things to be built into you. So if you haven't really started living yet, if you've been forgive the terminology, but if you've been living in your mother's basement and... <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, exactly. You know, if you haven't been working, if you haven't been making a living, if you haven't been even striving in your education or, you know, whatever kind of experiences that you have, it's those hardships and those difficulties and the suffering and the struggles. And those are the, those are the portals where grace leaks through into our lives and creates those builds those virtues in us, builds, you know. You can't ever learn patience if you've never been put in a situation where you have to be patient. So that's mm. where action comes in. We have to, the world is a forum for action. It's not, you know. And I, I think in terms of the forum for action, one thing that might, like if someone's hearing this and thinking, that sounds great, but I still don't know where to begin. This, this might help because I think if someone goes in the route of where to begin, that will come back to bite them. I agree with everything you said about allowing opportunities to shape us. And that's what striving for perfection is. But maybe a way to conceptualize that so people do just go and live. Hey, it might not be God's will for me to have this job now, but Throw that out the window. It's God's will for you to be saved. That's always his will. And you, you, you can use a job. You can even use a job interview as the centerpiece of your salvation. You never know. Because it's not our doing, we never know what we'll do. It. <laughs> we never know. It could be this conversation. It could be a 50-year pension. You never know. You never know. And so maybe a way to conceptualize it is she wants to say, because remember she goes to the one versus the many, mm -hmm. and she's a believer in the one. So she says all the virtues are really one virtue. 
the good that transcends all. So maybe a way to think about that is because we know that's true. Mathematics, arithmetic, for example. All arithmetic is is one, unity. But because we rely on the unity, we can generate difference. So I can have one, or I can have two, which is two ones, or I can have five ones. Wittgenstein made, made this argument. A million is just a million ones. So there's potentially infinite ones, and I can generate all dimensions, all measurements, all calculuses from one thing. And I know there is one, even if I don't draw the one, but I draw five plus five, I know I can decompose that into ones because when someone presents to me a fraction, a ratio, that division presupposes a unity. 1.5 is not one and one anymore. It's half of a, the second one. And because of that division as a built-in concept of arithmetic, I know it's built on a, a kind of unit. Mm -hmm. And yet I can never put my finger on the unity. The two plus five equals seven, not the two, not the five, and not the seven, even though the, the goal of this operation of addition is the seven output. Nowhere is there one more present than in any other place. So I want to develop a skill. I want to become holy. I want to become perfect. I want to love and be loved. You don't actually start. Just being is all you ever need. And now you just have to like figure out Okay, how do I like, how do I, how do I live? Well, I'm going to live. That will be my answer to how do I live? I'm going to live. And the unity of the goodness of all the virtues actually carry from when I'm 12, studying in high school, to when I'm 22, graduating from college, to when I'm 30, applying for a state government job. The, the numbers seven, five, and two are different. And it can be tempting to think, oh, I've come a long way. But in fact, it's just a lot of good differences because, and I can even say, well, it's better to have a full-time job than a part-time job because there's a little bit more of this little part here, but I can only make that comparison because there's this transcendent idea of fullness that carries over. Even if all I do today is fold a shirt, that's still participating in the good. Someday I could own a, a manufacturing plant. It seems like it's a lot more, but it's still built on that foundation that has carried over from one to a million without ever being located just in one or five or some realm of numbers in some ideology, in other words. Mm -hmm. Well, sure. And, and going back to the video that we watched at the very beginning, um, I, don't know, I just lost my train of thought. You were talking about the one and the many and the finding the good in just living your life. Um, can't remember what I was gonna say about the video, but, but I do think in this thing about just living your life, if you go back and look at, you said, you know, God always wants you to be saved, but he, the word also says that everybody is supposed to take care of their own families, right? So we know, we know we have certain responsibilities. So getting a job is a good thing because you have certain responsibilities. You need to carry them out. If, if you're, if you are hungry, you know, you need to get a job because that's the only way you're going to get to eat, right? So um, the world is kind of built in such a way that you're guaranteed to start learning all these virtues. You have a guaranteed path if you just enter the flow and start the job, whatever, whatever your work is, if you just get going on it, you have a guaranteed path to gaining virtue. That's a great way to say it. It's a great way to say it. Um, guaranteed path, yes. And, and it's not to virtue. It's virtue begins with the choice that I am going to walk this path. Like that's like the moment you choose, the moment you decide, as Kierkegaard would say, you are virtuous. 
And you are particip I would say, you are participating in the, the energies of God. Because what allowed you to choose? Yes, I'm going to work. I'm going to look my best friend in the eye as we're speaking. Something so small. It takes Jesus Christ to make you look your friend in the eye when speaking to them. It, like when Peterson would say, humans don't know, how did, how did he put it? Uh, they look for the virtue or the vice or something like this. They just don't know to look. Ah, I forgot. How do you say it? They look they down enough? They don't know how to look low enough. There we go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just holding eye contact is an act of God on our behalf through Christ. Like when he came and he became human, he redeemed all the flesh. <laughs> Every square inch. And when he, here's, here's something. God didn't come into the world as a human being. This is, some, some fellow believers won't agree with me on this. He didn't come as a substitutionary atonement. And he certainly didn't come as a ransom to be paid to the devil because of what our ancestors did in the garden. Because that would be to say that the father is a judge who can't, wait to get his payment because his justice is his priority like i've heard people in the past make that argument in different circles god isn't about his justice in the way we think of justice because in a murdochian sense if all we do is isolate god's justice and say that's the primary thing and that's why jesus came to pay the ransom so god's justice could be satisfied you're saying that justice can exist apart from his love his meekness, his holiness, his shyness, his still small voiceness. They're all one. All right. All right. And we're in his image. So we're all one. So what is, and that was his prayer in John 17, that we would be one as we are one, that we would be it. Well, the fall happened. Okay. So he came not to pay a ransom or to be a substitute for this atonement idea, like feudal stuff and pain payments, which is all just metaphorical fantasy. He came to heal us like a doctor, to be our medicine. So when he, I'm sorry, this is going long, but when he, uh, in today's gospel, in today's reading that I'm on a plan, and on today's reading, the, a man came to Jesus, a father, and he pushed the crowd away and he got on his knees and he said, Lord, my son is an epileptic and severely damaged. He falls into the fire and into the water. So I'd like for us to use that word picture because it's very important for what happens next. He falls into the water and into the fire. He's unstable. And he's an epileptic. You don't know what's going to happen and come out of his mouth next. He can be quick. He can even be manic. And he's not in control. And he's in a place where he doesn't want to be. God came to redeem everything in us and to heal us. That's why he came. And so when he speaks to us, he doesn't just speak from a vacuum words that are timelessly true in the sense of, oh, God, I finally got my ideal word in. Thank you, God. No, he speaks to the situation to heal it. So when the father said that, the father also said, your disciple and your disciples couldn't heal him. Jesus says, how long must I be with this perverse generation? I'm just imagining him getting angry, speaking these words that just come out of nowhere. How long must I bear with you? Very important. Be with you and bear you. Bring him to me. And he heals him. I would submit that Jesus was taking the sin of epilepsy and of falling and being unstable into himself that very moment and healing. And that's why he used those words because they not only informed his disciples that they had schisms among themselves 
And they thought, well, bring him to Peter. Peter's higher in the rank. He has more virtue for that sort of disease. They were, they were making distinctions amongst themselves. So nobody could do it because they weren't being one. So Jesus spoke to their schisms and also embodied the schism like an epileptic, metaphorically, literally being out of his mind and not one with his body and falling into the water instead of staying on the solid ground, falling into the fire instead of tending it. He used those words and became those words and brought it into his eternal divine nature with his father and then gave it back as healing. That's what the incarnation means. That's why he died, not just came down, gave us good words, and then ascended. He had to die to go all the way down to our mortality and then be resurrected to heal it. So when we say, you know, Jesus heals us, he doesn't just give us thoughts. He doesn't just give us liturgies. He doesn't just give us art. He literally heals our epilepsy. He literally becomes it and heals it and transforms it and brings all the darkness and shines light out of it. It's, it's medicine. Yeah, so I, 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 I had a big thought, <laughs> which, which I'm starting to lose, but um, the idea of where he was at with his disciples, the problem, I, I liked what you said about the disciples not really focusing on the problem because they were focusing on who was more important and you know who had more power than the other one and so forth because they weren't united, right? So remember back at the very beginning when Peterson was talking about love being the the boundary or being the entity within which truth can reside. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, so, so somehow that encompasses all of reality and more, the way, the truth, and the life. But that also means that that, that is showcased inside of love. Now, that's probably his love for us because we, we love because he first loved us, right? But also he tells us in John, is it 17, somewhere 15 to 17, somewhere in there, love one another as I have loved you. For when the world sees your love for one another, then they will see me, more or less is what he's saying. That so as we love one another, we become a display case for his glory. And I think that's what Peterson is talking about, that when he may not know that's what he's talking about, but that <laughs> the principle that he's evincing there is this principle of love being the, the display case or the dominant element that allows truth to be showcased. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So he shines out when we love one another. Yes. And it reminds me of the Greek word for truth, aletheia or aletheia or something like this. And the sense of it is not a target, not a arrow hitting target. Not as if a rhetorician had a nice turn of phrase that made the point stick. It's this idea of an opening out into a vast nature and seeing it, having it presented. So the idea is walking out in your backyard and seeing the trees and the butterflies moving past and the dandelions swaying in the breeze and now a bird landing on the branch and that happening more or less simultaneously is truth. To your very point. Wow, that's, that's a big idea. I'm going to have to go back and listen to that again. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but you encased it, which was so beautiful. Like, I don't know if you've seen the show Beauty and the Beast, but I'm sure there's a mythological correlate to what you said. You remember that floating rose with the petals mm -hmm. and how glass must be put on top and no one can break it. And I don't remember why, but it has something to do with the beast becoming an animal and not a human. Well, the rose had to be protected. 
I mean, the glass was on top of it to protect the rose. When the glass came off, then the rose was open to the elements and then it would disintegrate. Mm. Now, I don't remember if that was the enchantment or the breaking of the enchantment when the rose oh. fell apart, you know? Yeah. I just remember that at the end, when the rose fell apart, then he, he went up into the air and he was transformed from a beast into a man and then he came back down and now he's a man. So. But and I notice that rapturing and the high and the low. Oh yeah. And the light. He was he was transfigured. Yes. As Jesus was. And but I don't remember the symbolism of how the rose fitted into that because that's I don't either. A long time but, I watched it. But in that idea of the alatia, of the revealing, this wide panorama with simultaneity, when Jesus was transfigured, like the beast, oh, Jesus is not a beast, but we might say the flesh that the Logos came and became when he was shining with uncreated light, when, when we got to see the timelessness of the Logos with the Father before time, what we can look forward to when we are composed. Like that's, that's what Christianity asks us to believe, is that these things aren't just possible, but this is inevitable. And the question becomes not if, but when we are enlightened and illuminated will it feel like fire that we cannot run away from or and that tortures our soul or will it be everything ineffable that we've always wanted couldn't articulate and thank god we couldn't articulate it too soon because we wouldn't have believed there could have been anything better right so when he was transfigured immediately peter says Oh, I see, uh, forgive me if it was Ezekiel or Elijah, one of him, one of the two, and Moses. So when Jesus was transfigured at Tabor, the truth was also opening the past and bringing the past figures into company with their moment. And truth was showing in the same way that when God spoke out of the burning bush without consuming it, uncreated light, divine energies. He spoke the names of past patriarchs. I am the God. I am present tense of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. And when Jesus said, you don't know the power of the scripture, you don't know the power of God or the scriptures, God said in the present tense, I am of those people. When the truth was unfolding, it goes to this Alatia idea that when the truth arrives and when you walk in it, you're not in July 31st, 2020. Yes, you are, but you're also in all of it. And that's why they saw the past prophets contemporary with Jesus on the mountain and thought, we need to do something right now to fix it and to keep them here. Let's build them a shrine, an altar. And that wasn't the point. We won't have to build altars to all these things when the truth arrives because they're not going anywhere. They're always around. And I think that's so one great is, argument for art. Like so when you make art. Mm -hmm. What was that? What was that? So the truth is eternal. Yes. And when we abide in the truth, we're abiding in the eternal. Right? And, and I think Murdoch realizes this when she says, gaze upon great art. It's inexhaustible. Where are you? Where is it? How deep is that? poem or painting penetrating you from Van Gogh? And how deeply are those sunflowers interjecting subjectively with your personality and your personality now being mapped onto the brushstrokes of his choices? So that when you leave and now you look at your wallpaper, you say, God, what am I? What have I done? I need to change my life. <laughs> right? This. Well, if, if we had the proper vision, we would look at the creation of the greatest artist and not just of a human artist, but we would look at another human being that way. And we would contemplate the beauty and the complexity and the tremendous gift that each other human being is, you know, that they're created in God's image. And that by looking, truly looking at another human being, we can learn more about God and more about his image and grow more in love with him. And, uh, and maybe even, find ways to love one another and be loved by one another? 
I think that's what you just said is a great argument for taking the eyes away after it's almost as if great paintings, great art, things that have been preserved are teachers to lead us to the Alatia. Like we're not supposed to look at them forever and become engrossed. We're supposed to look at them and say, ah, good reminder, it is possible. Now I can turn my gaze away, as you said, real life. What you were evoking with, because the, the temptation is real. I don't want to go fix my car. I want to go on Google and look at paintings. I say this, I want to look at some beautiful paintings. I want to read a novel by Tolstoy. I don't want to go pay my taxes. Well, okay, maybe use like 10 minutes by the grace of God. Read Tolstoy, see the bigger picture. But the purpose of that bigger picture through Tolstoy's gift of narrative is so that you can have the faith to close it and go pay your taxes. Because Tolstoy was trying to evince that world. He wasn't trying to build an escape from it. And so, this might surprise you. This takes me to confession. <laughs> the sacrament of confession. I think this is the great beauty of confession. Art teaches us to confess and to find strength in going to confession. So, for example, I look at the art and think, okay, beauty is possible, proportion is real. If I look away and start to look at myself, oh my God, I'm disproportioned. Oh my God, I don't have any thoughts. Oh my God, I'm kind of a worthless work in progress. And then you add some re real details, real vices, real things you wouldn't want to tell anyone. God then gives these people that are set apart as priests to sit without judgment, without in detachment, to use the word you used earlier, mm -hmm. detached like a, like a great connoisseur of art, an aficionado, a great writer goes and just sits with it and gazes at the thing and lovingly details every choice that was made. So this pastor, this priest sits and listens to you in the confidentiality. Talk about, yeah, I watch pornography or even whatever, whatever the person, you know, just something like really mundane and vile. And I, I, I'm a racist. There are all these bigoted stuff. They just say it. Whatever it is, it's like, oof, that's not redeemable. That's pretty bad. I'm glad you got that off your chest. Never do that again. But through the grace of, of uh, confession and this priest literally being Jesus and forgiving and healing through the medicine of confession, we are restored to the Father like the prodigal son. And we can then leave just like when we leave the art museum, empowered to go on to perfection without apology, because we've been cleansed of the guilt. One thing she brings up, Iris Murdoch, often in this essay, is sadomasochism. And how if the religious understanding of sin is not trained with the sacraments, confession being one of them, we can go down a path of sadomasochism, where we elevate suffering. And it's a hard road and just grin and bear it and even make all kinds of caveats for sexual perversions and all these distortions as a way of finding myself. It's sadomasochism or it's masochism without the sadism, whatever. And I, when, I, when she said that, I thought, oh my God, I've never thought of original sin that way. And even Christians participating in this kind of glorification of suffering. God doesn't call us to glory in our suffering calls us to work out our salvation. So The other precious thing about confession is that it helps you sort through in your own mind as you're confessing what were the specific sins. Instead of just saying, oh, wow, I'm a loser and I don't measure up and I'm hopeless and I'm worthless. Because where do you go with that? I mean, there's, mm. there's no forgiveness for being worthless. But, <laughs> but for specific sins, for specific areas of failing, for specific times of missing the mark, then that is something that you can confess, you can gain forgiveness, and then you can begin to work on that, right? Because it's very specific. 
And I think that's one of the great gifts because we always have a tendency to catastrophize and bundle everything up into one great big united whole and try to crush ourselves with it. Mm. Well right. said. Well, maybe this is a good place to end. And, uh, yeah. and next week you are going to join me with Matt, with Michael and Luke. So we'll have a four four way conversation next week. It should be quite interesting. I don't know. Indeed. What the topic, I don't know what the topic is yet, but looking forward. Thank maybe. you, Karen. You guys can work it out on Boxer and we'll figure it out. <laughs> have a good day. Have a great and blessed week. Thank you. Thank you.